a warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni who are joining us today for this webinar. How do national oversight institutions influence security sector governance? My name is Dr. Katherine Lena Kelly, and I am the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law and the Interim Academ Academic Dean here at the Africa Center. And I'm pleased to be opening this webinar, which is just the second in our new quarterly series on the rule of law in African security sectors. The professionalism of the security services and citizens' perceptions of it hinge upon having a system of checks and balances that ensures that everyone respects civil liberties and the rule of law. Formal national level oversight institutions, both within and beyond the military, institutions like inspectorates, military ombuds institutions, parliaments, independent, independent anti-corruption and human rights commissions, and so forth, play a key role in monitoring security force behaviors towards citizens that affect popular trust in the security services, and in turn, the extent of rule of law in the security sector. Today, we hope that this webinar will provide a forum to explore the strengths and weaknesses of security sector oversight by a range of formal institutions internal to the state that under the right conditions have the potential to bolster democratic and civilian control of the security sector. More information about the Africa Center's work on rule of law and security sector governance can be found on the Africa Center website under the programs tab. But before we introduce the objectives for today and begin the discussion, let me turn it over to our acting director, uh, retired Colonel Dan Hampton. Dan. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, good afternoon or, or good morning, depending upon where you're connecting from today. And thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and for your interest in this very important webinar. As Dr. Kelly mentioned, my name is Daniel Hampton and I'm the deputy director and current acting director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I know we have many alumni who are here with us this morning for this webinar, and those of you who may be familiar with the Africa Center, and we have some new faces who may not. So just briefly about who we are. The Africa Center was established by our Congress in 1999 for the study of security issues relating to Africa and serving as a forum for research, communication, and exchange of ideas. To achieve this mandate from our Congress, we've developed the following mission statement. To advance African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Within the Africa Center, we're organized around three pillars to execute our mission. The first is our academic affairs section, which organizes seminars, workshops, and events, such as the one you're participating in today. Second is our research and strategic communications. If you're not familiar with the website, I would encourage you to go there and go there frequently. All our publications are posted in PDF format, free to download in multiple languages. We have recurring spotlights, sort of like blog posts on current and relevant issues. And there's just a wealth of information on the Africa Center website. So I encourage you, africacenter.org, to make it a resource that you use frequently. I think you'll find it very useful. And our third pillar is our community and alumni affairs. And that's the key element to building and sustaining those enduring partnerships that I spoke of in our mission statement. You're with us today for this webinar, but we don't want it to be just for 90 minutes. We want you to be part of the Africa Center family, to use our resources, to let us be available for you. And that's what our community alumni affairs section does. It stays connected to you, and we hope that you stay connected to us. Now, lastly, I'm very excited about the seminar, or this webinar that we're putting on this morning that Dr. Kelly has organized and the great panels we have. How do national oversight institutions influence security sector governance? That's a very important question. We talk frequently about oversight, transparency, and finally, accountability. And it starts with oversight bodies and organizations, ombudsmen, inspector generals, and the other organizations that Dr. Kelly spoke of. And that's how you then ultimately achieve accountability, transparency within institutions within government. So I'm excited about this. The information we're gonna hear, uh, the uh, the presentations from our panelists, and particularly the dialogue with all of you after this. So Dr. Kelly, over to you. Thank you, I'm looking forward to this. Thank you, Dan. 
Uh, so in terms of objectives for this webinar, we're hoping that uh, through the speakers that we have with us today, um, that we're very lucky to hear from, we will review the potential and the current performance of institutions like military inspectorates, ombuds institutions, legislatures, independent human rights or anti-corruption commissions, and review their role in facilitating rule of law and military professionalism, particularly as part of a broader process of democratic and civilian oversight of the security sector as envisioned in the 2013 African Union policy framework on security sector reform. We also hope to have a chance to reflect on the constraints of formal security sector oversight institutions and in furthering the implementation of the AU framework, as well as how to overcome these challenge, challenges so as to bolster African security force professionalism in service of the rule of law. And finally, we will discuss ways that African state and societal actors can strengthen these oversight institutions. With that, let's get down to business. I will introduce the panelists, um, if they could join me on the dais now. They come from different parts of the African continent. They're highly regarded experts on today's theme, and we're lucky to have them with us to share their knowledge and experiences on Western and Southern African perspectives on this issue. First, we have with us Brigadier General and Professor Dan Kowali, who serves in the Malawi Defense Force as the Chief of Legal Services and Judge Ad Advocate General. He is also an extraordinary professor of international law and international relations at the University of Pretoria, and visiting professor at Lund University. He has been a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and has served as a legal advisor for the UN mission in the DRC. Currently, um, he's a fellow and scholar at the US Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And today he speaks in his own personal and individual capacity, not in his institutional capacities. He is currently also the chairperson of the Malawi National Inter International Humanitarian Law Committee and he was plenipotentiary for the Republic of Malawi in the negotiations on the cluster munition convention, con, excuse me, cluster munition convention and the arms trade treaty. Um, he's also published extensively. Um, his latest publication is the Palgrave Handbook on Sustainable Peace and Security in Africa, which we should all check out after this. We have with us as well, Dr. Emil Wadrogo, who is an adjunct professor of practice with us here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. He specializes in issues related to national security strategy development and security sector governance. He's a member of the African Security Sector Network and founding president of the Fondation pour la Sécurité du Citoyen of Burkina Faso. Prior to joining the Africa Center, Dr. Wadrogo completed a six month mission with the AU as a security sector reform and governance expert for Madagascar. And he was minister of security of Burkina Faso from 2008 to 2011, after 30 years of service with the Burkina Faso Army, he retired from active duty in 2012 as a colonel, having served in positions including aide to the prime minister, support regiment commanding officer, and chief of the military intelligence division at the Army General Staff. Interestingly enough, Dr. Wadrogo was also a parliamentarian in the National Assembly of Burkina Faso and ECOWAS Parliament, where he sat on the Political Affairs, Peace, Defense, and Security Committees. Uh, so we're very lucky to have both of these panelists um, with us today to share their insights. And with that, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and start the discussion. So um, let me start by pointing out, um, many in the audience probably already know this as well, but the AU framework on security sector reform names a range of oversight institutions in the executive branch of government that help to ensure that no member of the security sector will act in contravention of national or international laws without being held accountable. Um, so for example, in the AU framework on SSR, member states are encouraged to set up institutions like inspectors general or ombudspersons for the security sector. So to begin on that note, let me turn to Dr. Kuali. Um, Dan, could you please explain how various oversight institutions within the security sector and specifically the executive branch are intended to promote the rule of law and um, especially why security sector officials have an interest in strengthening these institutions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, for that question and uh, greetings to all esteemed colleagues participating in this uh, webinar. Uh, as Kat said, uh, I'm Dan Kuali. And uh, before I address your question, uh, please allow me to provide a clarity on the uh, concepts of uh, security sector uh, reform 
and uh, security sector governance that are usually used interchangeably, but are not necessarily the same, uh, so that we should be uh, on the same page. So to start with, uh, security sector governance, as uh, most colleagues uh, in the room know, uh, refers to the structures and uh, processes uh, that shape decisions about uh, security and their implementation. Whereas uh, security sector reform aims at uh, enhancing security sector governance through the effective and efficient uh, delivery of um, security uh, under conditions, of course, of uh, democratic control uh, of the security sector. So in terms uh, uh, of uh, simplicity, the objective of security sector reform is to achieve uh, good security sector governance where security actors are effective and accountable uh, to the people. Another key point that we need to be aware of is that uh, security sector reform, in my view, does not only apply to uh, post-conflict settings, it also applies to um, transitional and uh, developed uh, states. So suffice to say that uh, the concept of uh, security sector reform coincided with the post uh, Cold War paradigm shift from uh, which was focusing on uh, state security uh, to a broader perspective now of uh, human security as uh, pronounced by uh, the uh, Human Development Report uh, by the UNDP in uh, 1994. Now, uh, Dr. Kelly, to answer your question, uh, the starting point is that uh, the AU framework on uh, security sector reform requires that security sector uh, should adhere to the same rules of good governance as any other public institution. Uh, this is in line with the democratic principles of uh, respecting the rule of law. Security sector reform also has an advantage of uh, curbing conflict and uh, promoting peace and security due to the professionalism and the discipline of uh, the security actors. Generally, in uh, today's uh, democratic dispensation and uh, security environment, the security sector comprises uh, broadly four groups, uh, namely, uh, number one, the core security actors. So these are the professional arms that we know. That is to say the military, the police, the gendarmerie, correctional services, uh, you name it. The second category is uh, the security management and oversight bodies. So this will include uh, ministries of defense or sometimes uh, ministry of uh, international, uh, rather internal affairs, uh, the financial management bodies and uh, public uh, complaints commissions. The third, which is usually overlooked is the justice and uh, law enforcement institutions, such as the judiciary, uh, prison or correctional services, prosecution services, and uh, so on. The fourth is uh, the non-statutory security forces. Uh, we all know that uh, at the moment, in most of our countries, we are flooded by private security companies. So this is also another category of uh, the non-statutory uh, security uh, actor. The security sector should have uh, uh, oversight institutions, such as uh, the Inspectorate General or the Ombudsperson uh, for the security sector, the reason is that we need to promote accountability and also to entrench uh, professionalism and effectiveness. Uh, given the technical nature of uh, the security organs and the requirement to adhere to national security objectives and also not to compromise our national security. So most uh, defense forces on the continent of Africa today uh, have established the office of uh, the inspector general uh, however, it is uh, common to it is not common uh, in most uh, African countries to have uh, the ombudsperson of uh, the security sector. Taking an example of Malawi, you see that uh, the police, uh, the Malawi Police Service, has an office of the Independent Complaints Commission, which does similar work as uh, the ombudsperson of the security sector is supposed to do. Uh, otherwise. Uh, public office of uh, the ombudsman, which I think most of our countries on the continent have, uh, would cater for all complaints relating to maladministration by uh, public office officials, uh, including uh, uh, security actors. 
in my view, it is in the best interest of uh, the security organs to be subject to oversight institutions, such as uh, the anti-corruption bodies and uh, public audit mechanisms uh, to promote efficiency and uh, accountability. Uh, for example, when security organs are subject to audit, the executive and the legislature branches of government will ensure that the security sector is given sufficient uh, resources to procure appropriate equipment, to conduct uh, relevant training, and perform their constitutional uh, functions. So where the security sector does not have an internal oversight institution as required by uh, the AU policy framework on uh, SRR, they will be subject to the public oversight uh, mechanisms as it is critical component of uh, the principle of democratic control of the security sector. Now, uh, in such circumstances, uh, the relevant public officers should take the necessary oath of secrecy to avoid compromising national security. Uh, I thank you so much, uh, Kate, for, for this opportunity and uh, I'll be happy to take further questions. Thank you. Thank you, General Kowali. Um, great. Um, so that's a, sort of an introduction on the executive branch side of things. And I'd like to turn to Emil now, who has served, um, as you heard, both in the armed forces and as a parliamentarian, and ask him about the legislative side of, of oversight. Um, so Dr. Emil, could you briefly explain why legislative oversight of the security sector is an important tool for promoting rule of law and good governance in the security sector? Um, we're hoping you could give us uh, an example or two of some aspects of parliamentary work that affect rule of law in the security sector. And in particular, um, I know in um, past work we've done together at the Africa Center with parliamentarians, we've discussed um, why security sector officials and parliamentarians have an interest in having a cooperative relationship um, sometimes as opposed to an adversarial one that might be the more stereotypical one that we would think of. So if you could spend just six or seven minutes giving us an overview of some of these questions, we'd be grateful. Merci, uh, Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. And hello to everyone. I am always delighted uh, to be in this type of uh, exchange of ideas environment. So it is an enormous pleasure for me to be participating in this forum. So Dr. Kelly, uh, you uh, asked me uh, essentially three questions within one question, but there are three aspects. Uh, the first aspect uh, means that I will talk about parliamentary oversight uh, to promote rule of law and governance. And the second aspect uh, will lead me to talk about the role uh, and the functions of parliamentarians. And finally, I will talk about the relations between parliament and the executive branch in terms of security. So quickly, I will first say that institutions and oversight uh, mechanisms in any country, and, and particularly in Africa, are the, the central pillars of democracy. They strengthen rule of law uh, against all and democratic actions and against bad governance, uh, as uh, we just spoke about. And I, uh, I for me, it, is state uh, that is does not have democratic oversight is not a good state. Democratic oversight and this oversight of the security uh, sector by the parliament is at the core of the separation of powers and the sharing of powers. So it is absolutely necessary. And it also serves as a barometer to uh, measure how well integrated democracy is. And so we can see that in many countries, especially African countries, uh, the more um, the more this uh, democratic oversight is effective than rule of law and democracy are better anchored in the foundation of the country. When you see a country where there is this lack of democratic oversight, 
then in, in these situations, uh, you will see that uh, within these countries, there are a lot of uh, issues and that there is often bad governance. So this topic, today's topic is extremely relevant. And so we're going to try and um, get into it. So the second aspect of your question is about the, the functions of parliamentarians within the security sector to strengthen and, and consolidate rule of law and to improve governance. I would say the consolidation of a rule of law in a country is a shared responsibility uh, between the three powers. The, um, between the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. But what we uh, must keep in mind is that implementation uh, is really the executive's role. The executive, uh, however, the parliament must question uh, the executive's actions. This is democratic oversight. So this is really to sustain the principles of good governance, uh, rule of law, and the legal framework, and to uh, preserve human rights. So the, I will say, now the role given to parliament, as you asked, is essentially, um, in the promulgation of uh, legislation uh, for the sector, the security sector, and doing this through debates, investigations, visits to the field, and the organization of sessions open to the public in order to promote transparency. And to, and as you know, uh, the Defense and Security Commission within the parliament uh, performs this role. So parliamentary oversight therefore means to ensure that uh, government resources are well managed, that the security sector personnel conducts itself with honor, and that when there are problems, they are corrected, and that those who commit bad acts are held responsible. So, and this is to ensure that um, security sector institutions act in the interests of the nation and protect the nation from external threats. Now, thirdly, uh, cooperation and collaboration between parliamentarians and the sector of security is absolutely necessary. They need each other in order to implement an efficient security policy. They cannot be adversaries. In order to do this, they must establish a dialogue framework that is based on mutual trust, and they must also establish open communication and have the will to participate, to work together. So uh, parliamentarians and the security sector are really links within a single chain, and they reinforce democracy by working together. I hope this answers your question, Dr. Kelly. Thank you so much, Emil. Yes, um, I asked you a lot in that six minutes and you covered quite a bit of ground for us on the legislative side of oversight. Um, I want to um, stick with you here, Dr. Emil, for, to ask you a second follow-up question. Dr. Emil is also the author of Advancing Military Professionalism, which is one of the Africa Center's um, research reports that we've published um, over the last few years. And so uh, based on that, we know that you've provided um, in writing um, available on the website for everyone if they wish to read some recommendations on some of these issues. And so um, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Emil, what are your top three lessons learned based on your experience about how to strengthen the roles of military ombuds institutions and inspectorates to effectively ensure that there's uh, oversight in the security sector. Um, if you could spend another six or seven minutes elaborating on your recommendations there, that would be of great interest. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. I, I hope you, I, I just had a power cut here, so I hope you can hear me. So I'm going to try to establish the link um, with the preceding question 
by talking about these uh, oversight mechanisms and the, the uh, regulatory, regulatory documents and the laws, and they govern the security forces. Now, in when my article was published in 2014, so it's a little bit out of date and I need to probably revise it, but, um, you know, advocating for the professionalization of armed forces in Africa. Um, I talked about the uh, inspection services, uh, parliamentary oversight, and and the mediators and the ombudsman. Don't prior talking prior to talking about lessons learned. I will first summarize what I said in this article. Inspection services, uh, those in Africa are not operational very often. They're really internal uh, uh, systems that are set up within our ministerial uh, services. If you you know look at the architecture of ministerial uh, offices, you will see an inspection services. So their mission, their main mission is to verify the enforcement of laws, of rules and ministerial decisions uh, that have to do with administrative and financial aspects and um, armed forces, etc. And so they're supposed to participate in the creation of uh, national strategies and to ensure the proper management of the ministry. Unfortunately, we, we must say that these in our countries, these departments are not very operational. So often, so often they're just added on to, uh, because they fit within the organization chart of the ministry. And there is, uh, it's often, it, they are just a spot uh, to put uh, people who have been put out to pasture. Uh, a lot of inspectors of armed forces are former chiefs of staffs. And, and then the inspector within the Ministry of Security. When I became Minister of Security, uh, it, it was actually the former uh, director of the National Police. So when you take these high, former high level um, officials and you put them within this particular uh, function to do oversight and supervision, you, you can understand why this doesn't work properly. Um, in, in Mali, they, they realized that these inspection services were not operating properly. So. Uh, so actually, they've created an entity that reports directly to the president of the republic. Um, and so they, there is a report that is provided to the president and also to the minister of defense. And that has been done after having realized that these inspection reports did not actually reflect reality, that they were just abridged and, and they were not done properly. In terms of the uh, inspectors, the inspections, and to ensure good governments of our countries and also the establishment of rule of law, I must tell you that these inspections don't really reflect uh, the situations within our uh, countries. We see sometimes a lack of rules, a lack of regulations, of coordination between the different entities. So in terms of preventing and fighting um, corruption, it's very important to, to address this. But unfortunately, often these reports of these inspectors um, are lacking. It's sad to say these uh, annual activity reports often are not even properly used or used, unfortunately. They, um, they, they really 
are not uh, well adhered to, um, there's pushback. And so very quickly, um, people sometimes who fight this corruption are themselves put in prison. And so it's a very compromising situation. So what's really important is the parliamentarian oversight. Um, it's important to say that the parliamentarian oversight, the legislative bodies really remains the pillar for democracy. You have national assemblies who by their silence are guilty themselves. So the oftentimes the parliaments, the national assemblies, assemblies choose silence. And so they often use the excuse of uh, uh, confidential information, of, of, of classified information. So with this, we, we hope to improve the situation. This is why we must absolutely, um, absolutely lean on these lessons learned and, and, and have the military ombudsmen uh, that are very important to deal with question, military questions. Of course, it, we also have civilian ombudsman, but a military ombudsman could also deal with some of these questions. I think they must have um, a certain legal and political um, uh, uh, green light. And I think I mentioned in my paper that the importance of the parliament, the the role of the parliament, the oversight role of the parliament, what we must retain from this is that all of the African legislatures have a mandate. And, but why do they not fulfill them? I believe that the forum uh, noted that the mandate, this mandate is the only defense line guardrail to improve governments and to avoid the dysfunctionality that exists. And for this to take place, the parliamentarians must, uh, as we say, have the, th the three A's, the uh, ability, the authority, and the attitude, because the ability do the legislature, legislatives, do the parliamentarians um, have the knowledge and the to uh, to have authority? And it's also to to do proper oversight. Are they properly motivated? Do they have the right attitude? So that is the uh, last of the three A's. So. I believe that one way or another, what we can learn, the lessons learned, is to strengthen good governments. We have to also strengthen the uh, legal side and the military of the military. We, there are on the African continent, uh, many, uh, many instances of inefficiency. And when we, re when we read this document, we have to be careful that military justice uh, follow, follow the proper rules. And for example, dis disciplinary actions to be taken must be able to, to, to fulfill the uh, requirements of military justice. We also need to strengthen, need to strengthen uh, the uh, code uh, conducts, conduct codes. 
And we also need to uh, strengthen civic education because to ensure that also that the conduct of military personnel is undertaken properly and follows the rules. There are some challenges to this. Uh, it's important to have training, education, civic training and education, and to avoid the abuses that, that take place every day on the continent. And for example, we have dilemmas how to um, how to deal with a soldier who was uh, captured and tortured uh, by rebels or terrorists. How do we deal with this? And this does not explain all of the violences that we see currently on the continent. But thank you. Thank you so much, Emile, for having uh, given us your recommendation uh, and uh, from and suggesting to bring up to date your 2014 paper and give these four recommendations. And I'm sure we will come back to that during the question and answer session. Thank you. I will switch back to English because I am going to come to um, Dr. Kowali with the next two questions. And I will also say I see that um, alumni and participants are already asking some questions on the Zoom chat. I encourage you to keep entering your questions because we will collect them for the question and answer session with the panelists after we finish the discussion. Um, so Dr. Kowali, let me come back to you now. Um, based on your experiences and your research, what do you think are the top two strengths and the top two weaknesses of inspectorates and ombuds institutions in particular in fostering security sector accountability to citizens. Um, feel free to use examples from Malawi or the Southern African region if you would like. And um, we're also interested in hearing just a bit for a few minutes about um, how human rights and anti-corruption commissions, these independent commissions that are in place in various countries could enhance checks and balances in the security sector um, and between the security sector and citizens. So um, again, asking you a lot in seven minutes, but if you could give us a brief overview um, and your point of view on this from the Malawian or Southern African perspective, that would add a lot. All right, no, thank you so much, uh, Kate, uh, for that question. I I'll give you uh, top five strengths instead, uh, but let me start with uh, the first uh, uh, two uh, weaknesses that have been requested. So first, in my view, is a lack of uh, strategic leader competences uh, and skills, particularly inadequate capacity, uh, given the complexity of the defense and uh, security sector. Second is uh, the lack of understanding of the notion of uh, civilian control of the security sector, especially the element of uh, what control entails. There is need for more awareness and training to develop expertise uh, in this regard. Uh, in Malawi, for example, uh, the top strengths include uh, availability of the legal framework for um, oversight mechanisms, uh, the willingness uh, of the security sector to comply with the law, uh, a healthy civil military relations, uh, a vibrant civil society, are uh, capable of scrutiny, a meticulous uh, legislature that is able to, to look at uh, what the security sector is doing, and more importantly, an independent judiciary. The High Court uh, of Malawi, uh, being a court of unlimited jurisdiction, handles any issue that is brought before it, including cases involving performance of the duties uh, of uh, the security institutions in Malawi. So uh, apart from uh, the oversight of uh, the Parliamentary Committee on Defense and Security, like uh, Dr. Wadrago just mentioned, uh, human rights and uh, anti-corruption uh, commissions are key institutions for oversight of the security sector. Their importance lies in the fact that uh, scrutiny and transparency uh, promote public trust and confidence in the security sector. However, uh, the drawback that I've noted is that uh, uh, these oversight mechanisms have usually uh, been reactive as opposed to being uh, uh, proactive. 
They usually come in when violations have already occurred. It is therefore important that uh, such constitutional bodies should take their proactive role seriously. Uh, they need to look at, uh, because their mandates provide for training and awareness. Uh, so they need to be proactive in order to save uh, public funds and resources and deter commission of violations. Of course, such oversight institutions should have the capacity and adequate uh, funding to perform their uh, roles. Because you see, time and again, they are also suffocated to perform their roles. So the security sector and oversight institutions are not rivals, just like uh, Emil mentioned. They're not rivals or enemies, but two sides of the same coin, which seek to serve uh, and protect the public. Therefore, there should uh, be a good working relationship between and among public entities. This underscores the importance of a national uh, security strategy or policy. Look, going by the uh, democratic uh, peace theory, you see that a country that respects democracy and the rule of law is unlikely to get into conflict. As such, uh, compliance with principles of security sector governance will not only strengthen professionalism, but also promote peace and security uh, in a given country. The national security strategy, uh, in my view, should also be in line with the development agenda uh, as uh, they are supposed to be complementary. Uh, I see that uh, the AU uh, uh, policy on uh, security sector reform specifically underscores that uh, the security sector should not undermine national development plans. Uh, I, I hope that answers uh, your, que your several questions, uh, Dr. Kelly. But yes, I'm happy to thank you. Some more, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kowali. Um, I'd like to ask you a follow-up in addition. Um, you covered a lot of ground there, um, and I want to take us back to the AU security sector reform framework, um, which also recommends regular reviews and audits of state-based oversight institutions for the security sector. I know that you've had some experience in Malawi in this domain with security sector audits, so could you explain um, how do you conduct such audits and what are some lessons learned about the steps that different African countries can take to make these audits most useful for actually strengthening professionalism in the military and law enforcement? Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Dr. Kelly. I have three points. First, while the uh, African Union has emphasized uh, uh, that uh, security sector reform we, we should also not lose focus on security sector governance, which in my view, I think is more relevant. Uh, like I said, uh, security sector reform was uh, prevalent just after the, the, uh, the, the, the post-Cold War era. So we also need to uh, focus on uh, security sector governance, like the implementation. The, the AU's SSR framework was adopted in 2013 and a lot has happened since then, uh, warranting a review of uh, the policy framework. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, the focus for reform or governance should not only be on the security sector, but also on the civilian authorities. As our theorists uh, Sam Huntington and uh, Morris Janowitz suggest, civil major relations is a two-way traffic. You cannot expect the security sector to be professional if the civilian authorities do not understand their roles and responsibilities towards the security sector. Uh, second, audits uh, should not only happen when uh, there is suspicion of fraud, misappropriation of funds or actual theft, but rather it should be a standing order, procedure or practice. The law usually uh, provides guidelines for audits and their timelines. Where there are no guidelines, strategic leaders should provide a policy framework for uh, periodic reviews or audits. In this way, uh, audits can provide a deterrent mechanism for abuse and misuse of uh, public funds. Uh, third is that uh, audits uh, should not just be limited to funds but should uh, also extend to processes like recruitment and uh, procurement procedures, even battle preparedness or readiness, uh, modernization and uh, force posture or structure. 
Uh, these defense uh, management frameworks are also statutory requirements with far reaching consequences. For example, recruitment affects the quality of soldiers and professionalism. Uh, therefore, it is also a process that should be taken uh, seriously. Uh, I must uh, add that uh, we need to extend the aperture of responsibility uh, for security sector governance uh, beyond strategic leaders. You may notice that uh, training on uh, security sector governance uh, the past couple of years is usually focused on the senior leaders, uh, leaving out the junior ranks who are critical in the operations of uh, security organs. I would suggest that uh, each and everyone in the rank and file uh, should be a, a steward of the profession and must be familiar with uh, security sector governance and the importance of uh, complying with uh, oversight mechanisms. Uh, this, in my view, is key to ensuring professionalism, cohesion, esprit du corps, and morale in the uh, profession of arms. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuali, for making these points. Um, and it's um, all of them are uh, extremely interesting. The one you're making about um, you know, junior officers and um, junior leaders um, in the security sector is a really particularly striking one here for us to end on with your remarks. So I would like to turn to Dr. Emil for one last question. And then we've been, we've been collecting questions and I see there are quite a few from alumni um, who are participating. So we'll get to that very soon. Um, Dr. Emil, um, you note in your research um, some of the rule of law and oversight challenges um, that African countries now face relate somewhat to the changing nature of threats over the last several decades. They're no longer primarily matters of military combat. They're tied to questions of how to provide citizen security and safety to citizens. Um, so we see unconventional threats, security issues related to organized crime or violent extremist recruitment or um, the circulation of small arms and light weapons. And um, you note in your paper and your report that that requires um, development and governance approaches um, in addition to maybe um, less conventional security sector approaches. So you have recommended reorganizing security force structures to better match the identified threats and integrating those missions into a coherent defense policy um, that will enhance the relevance, the operational capacity, as well as the prestige of African militaries. Um, so given all that, given that context, could you give us quickly an example of how security sector reorganization is currently occurring on the continent and how national security strategy development and implementation are likely to affect um, good security sector governance and the rule of law in Africa? Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. I see that your question once again has three to four sub-questions. Uh, so I have to give a, a, an overall uh, summary of what's, of what's going on power in terms of my, the paper that I published. And then I'll have to talk about the need to develop a, a strategy to face the new threats that are emerging and then how this national security strategy can have an impact on good governance and the security sector, it, it, uh, and good governance and rule of law. So I will say, I, I want to lay out the context a little bit because we have to assess the situation. ACSS, uh, within it, the framework of its program on, on the development of national security strategies, uh, there was a study that was carried out in 2018 of countries throughout the continent. I, I, so this involved Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Mali, Madagascar, Nigeria, Senegal, uh, South Sudan and South Africa, and finally Botswana. So this study was supposed to, to really review all the security strategies of these countries and to assess what needed to be done in the future. So um, the points that were brought up by this study uh, through, you know, through our countries in the continent, most countries, in Africa do not have an overall vision uh, of security is 
so something that um, allows you to evaluate your own uh, security architecture and, and makes it difficult to face threats. And this study showed that, was, that there was um, no consistency between the sectorial strategies uh, between countries. They, they're not um, consistent between different uh, branches of government. Each institution separately develops its own strategy without collaboration. So there's a lack of an overall vision. And this means that many threats, many risks are not taken into account uh, within the, the management of security. So we also saw that there was a security policy approach that is too much based on the state. Within these countries, security is first the state and the population is an afterthought. But you have to really reconcile both the security of the state and the security of the population. So this is a, a, an imperative for African countries to really develop national security strategies that can take into account the security of the state and human security. This is something that was found uh, in, in this study. And these, this study is available on ACSS's website. So this is a, a, a summary of, of this study. Now, after 2018, what's interesting is that a lot of African countries, and this is good news, a lot of African countries decided to develop national security strategies. And uh, so within these countries, you have Senegal, you have Niger, Burkina Faso, Botswana is in the process of doing this. Ghana just published it, its national security strategy. Nigeria uh, already had one in 2014, and they've actually just revised it. In this inclusive and participatory approach, uh, you know, that provides a holistic uh, vision of security issues. So we have all these strategies that are being developed. So it's so these uh, vision, it, there, there's this uh, goal of harmonizing all these security strategies and this will, this will make it possible to have an efficient and effective uh, management of resources and to consolidate democracy and rule of law. The impact of these strategies on good governance and on uh, rule of law and uh, the security sector. First, there is the inclusive and participatory nature of this process. This means that all parts of the population are taken into account in the development of these um, strategies. And the debate regarding as to what kind of security do we want for our country, the security of the state, the security of the population, you, you know, as I said, you need a strategy that takes into account the security of the state and the security of the people. And this has to be arrived at through a consensus. Uh, from all components of the country, the, the society. Now there are, uh, we know that conflicts within Africa are, are very different. They're not just inter-state, they're within states and, and there are issues with governance and rule of law issues. So emerging threats are taken into account during these new de the development of these national security strategies. And this provides transparency um, because this, these strategies reinforce transparency and, and this strengthens governance. And, and this can uh, actually help us in avoiding conflicts of interest. Now, the, the process, another uh, element is a, a strategic oversight. This, it, this allows states to um, anticipate uh, things, have this uh, anticipation capacity to react, this ability to have resilience in all of this. And if we look at the international environment, because no, no state 
uh, is completely isolated now. And when we look also at the fundamental principles of rule of law and the international um, instruments to which we must adhere, these all are items that can strengthen rule of law. Now to conclude, on top of uh, increasing anticipation, uh, capacity, uh, reactivity, etc., to to face these these threats, which have, uh, which are new. The um, national security strategy will provide Af African countries with an ideal framework for reinforcing rule of law and and good governance. This is within a context that is characterized by a, a significant lack of resources. So we, this allows us to focus on security, on, on the threats, to, and to ensure that democratic oversight it becomes institutionalized and that it becomes efficient and can be carried out within the legal framework of the constitution and rule of law. I hope this answers your question, Dr. Kelly. Thank you very much, Dr. Emil. Now, on those words, this was a very interesting conversation between the three of us, but for the rest of the webinar, we are going to turn to the questions that, were, that have been posed by our participants, our audience. Um, I'll give I'll give each of you um, a set of questions um, since we have about oh I don't know 17 minutes here um, and you should each feel free to address the ones that you wish um, maybe I'll help you sort of parse out who answers what um, uh, as you wish so let me give you um, we have quite a few so I'll give you um, five and we'll have to address them pretty quickly um, so here's the first one um, somebody from the audience says in my country Sierra Leone. The Defense Council is chaired by the president, while the Police Council is chaired by the vice president. These two councils form part of the governance mechanism, but have more direct, hands-on regulation of the operations of these two traditional forces. Is this not a potential obstacle to the role of parliament, for example, to deliver their own important role in the oversight process? So a specific question about um, executive control of some of these oversight mechanisms in Sierra Leone, and how does that affect the role of parliament to play its role? Um, we have another question, number two, um, also related to executive control, saying executive control is important as part of the general security sector governance mechanism. What should be guarded against is executive excesses in decision making, some of which sit outside of the dictates of the rule of law, especially in the interest of their political party. Um, so it seems to me that there's a question here about the role of political parties and partisan politics in the oversight process and executive controls in particular, given how strong the executive branch is in many different African countries. So do you have comments on the political parties um, role to play, um, positive or negative in this process? Um, a third question that we got is about um, distinguishing civilian and civil um, control. Um, is it, let's see, sorry, I've lost the question here in my list. Is there a difference between civil control and civilian control of the security sector? I ask because for maybe obvious reasons, some military personnel may prefer the idea of civil control as opposed to civilian control as they try to adjust or come around to the notion of control outside of the military itself. We also had some questions um, uh, from our French speaking audience. One is about the good example of Senegal in the domain of rule of law and security sector governance. Could either of you comment on this African example that folks in our audience are pointing to um, as an interesting one? I will also read one question out in French that we have as our first one. If it is true that the parliamentarian oversight should increase uh, and improve the performance of uh, the sector, how can we explain the um, 
the lack of performance in the countries, especially in the region of the Sahel. Emil, I think that this last question will be for you, uh, considering your uh, expertise. Um, either or both of you for, for either or both of you to weigh in on. Um, so we have the question about Sierra Leone and executive branch control of some of the services. We have the question about political parties and parliaments and, and their roles in oversight. The question about civil versus civilian control as a concept that could appeal to military officials who might be on board with rule of law and professionalism issues. Uh, the question about Senegal and the question about Sahelian parliaments. Um, so Dan, I'll go to you. Maybe you could focus on um, some of the first three. And Emil, you can take whatever you wish after that, but especially the last two that focus on your region. Uh, all right, Dr. Kelly, thanks so much. I, I wanted to yield to uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Emil for the purposes of seniority, but I take that as an order. <laughs> so yes, uh, I think I'll start with a simpler one whether there is a, a difference between um, civil control or civilian control. Look, initially when the concept of, was being uh, promulgated, the reasoning was that uh, civilian control of the military. But now they realize that uh, the essence of the control is really to enhance or entrench democratic values. So the theory actually changed to be called a democratic control of the military. Again, they realized that uh, by talking about the military, they are not including the police and other, uh, uh, other professional arms. So the thinking today is a democratic control of the security sector. So to answer your question, uh, civil control and civilian control, they are one and the same thing. It's just a question of nomenclature. But the correct balance at the moment is democratic control of the security sector. As you are aware, the rationale of this concept is to ensure that uh, decisions, important decisions about the use of force, the important decision about national security should be made by those who are accountable to the voters. We all know that generals are not voted into office. They are actually appointed by, uh, by political leaders. So you want decisions to go to war to be made by those who will be answerable uh, through the ballot. Let me also attempt to answer the issue of uh, executive control. The key, where you put the president and the vice president within the same decision-making framework, it, it really depends on what the law says. If that is the legal framework, then uh, we, we cannot fault it. But the disadvantage of, uh, of that approach is that uh, you tend to lose out on checks and balances, which provides for accountability uh, because you are then opening yourselves to fault. There is no one to to check you, you take this or you disadvantage yourself in terms of diversity of views, somebody who can counterbalance your view. Uh, and again, I mean, it uh, flouts the principle of separation of powers, which again, uh, tends to uh, achieve uh, accountability. Uh, in terms of uh, whether political parties uh, have a say in, uh, in uh, security sector reform or national security strategy, my, my short answer is yes, so long as they are representatives of the people. Citing an example of my country, Malawi, for example, if you look at uh, the constitution, it says that uh, the policies that the executive should initiate should reflect the wills and intentions, including aspirations of the people. So as long as uh, the political parties harness the aspirations, the will, the interests of the people, then they cannot be faulted. But if they put politics first and the interests of the people second, then uh, we're defeating the whole purpose of uh, uh, inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kowali. Yes, I think there's some other comments on the chat in French and in English about um, 
you know, differentiating between um, what um, one of our participants is calling cosmetic democratic institutions and sort of really deeply rooted institutions. And I think your point here about what the political parties are doing and the importance of them being representative of people's interests for this system um, of checks and balances to work um, at its maximal, in its maximal way is, is, is sort of um, alluding to or, or relates to some of those comments that we've seen on the chat that um, we haven't gotten to address in the Q&A, but I certainly acknowledge the points that people are making on the chat about the robustness of democratic institutions being needed for um, the wheels to turn properly in this system of, of different institutions for oversight that, that we're hoping um, uh, constitute um, democratic control of the security sector. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Kuali. Let me turn to Dr. Emil um, and feel free, Emil, to respond to any of the five that you wish, but particularly um, our questions about the Sahel, we hope that you'll be able to help us field as well, specifically. Uh, merci beaucoup, Dr. Kelly, and merci, Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, for, and to those who asked these very relevant questions, and which is at the heart of this webinar, speaking of the institutions of oversight in terms of governing the security sector. So the question is quite relevant. I will answer, I'll take a step back in terms of um, as an ex-parliamentarian myself at the National Assembly of Burkina. This question presents a problem. Why is there such a lack of, 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 uh, of responsibility on the part of the parliamentarians. We have to recognize, as I mentioned earlier, that democratic oversight and the um, separation of powers is, is the base of this must be in place to ensure this democratic oversight. If it is efficient, it can serve as a barometer for countries of the Sahel. The parliaments of the countries in the Sahel are given this power of oversight by their constitutions. They can, they can go to the army bases, they can take a look and see what's going on in the field, but they don't do it. Um, and the whole time I was in parliament, um, I saw very little of that. So if we, we have this, this tool, but if we don't use it, and if this is what's taking place, and this is what's taking place today, which I mentioned earlier, many African parliaments are democracy bankrupt. And why is this? Because they think once they are elected that they must defend the party that elected them. No, when you are in parliament, you must defend the national interest. You must defend and represent the entire population. You must drop partisanship. And everything that has, you must find solutions to all the problems that come up in the nation. And so this has led to unfortunate consequences in terms of, we see that the problems of uh, security oversight remain in the forefront in the countries of the Sahel. I believe also that parliament uh, to do its work, there sometimes is a lack of trust between the parliament and the executive. So the parliament, if they uh, understand the security problems properly, 
they can better respond to the problems. And so therefore, I believe it is important to come back to the fundamentals uh, that is the three A's. There has to be, there has to be the correct attitude, but the parliamentarians also must be able to work under conditions to be able to do their work. So attitude, motivation is often lacking. And that's, and one, we can also say that uh, the qualifications of certain parliamentarians, there are some natural obstacles. If the parliamentarians do not understand the topic and uh, that's an issue, and then, of course, authority. They must have the authority to exercise their responsibilities as parliamentarians. And it is important that the states uh, provide the parliamentarians what they need to do their work and undertake their responsibilities. They have to have financial resources to do so. And we we know that if this can happen, democracy will become stronger in the countries of the Sahel. There will be there will be a dialogue, uh, more of a, an exchange uh, of ideas and discussions at the, in the parliament to address these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emil. And because we only have two minutes left, and I saw other questions. I'm going to ask one more question to you, Emil. Is it based on your um, uh, knowledge of Senegal and democracy that has its traditions in, that also has developed a national security strategy? Can you make a short comment in the case of Senegal so that uh, be, uh, certain people ask the questions about it. And also there was a question in terms of the processes, processes for developing uh, this. And are there examples of countries, I believe it's true for Senegal, where civil society has been consulted during the process of the development of these strategies, civil society and the population. So two minutes, please, to uh, give an example of this, and then we will end with this example. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. And uh, thank you to the person who asked uh, about Senegal. I was in Senegal about a month ago. I was giving uh, courses on security sector reform and civil society was represented. The state, of course, was uh, represented, but it was organized by civil society. This training uh, by ECOWAS on the, uh, the reform of se the security sector. Now, Senegal. Senegal, it's not only Senegal, there's uh, Cape Verde uh, and other countries that have never had coup d'etats. Uh, this tradition of not having a coup is, ex is extremely important and, and means that for them, they have be more professional security forces because a coup let No, the, the involvement of security forces in the political arena really unprofessionalizes security forces. So for Senegal, which has never had a coup, the army remains focused on its primary mission. And this was reinforced by a professionalization of its forces uh, through uh, peacekeeping missions. And so they have remained politically neutral. And this is in, an important example to cite indeed. And, but then there are a few other countries. Now for uh, security and defense forces, once they get involved in politics and, and state governance, uh, once they, they dip their foot in politics, it is the beginning of the deprofessionalization of these forces. It's really a, a slippery slope. And, 
and this impacts governance and rule of law. So there you have it. Thank you so much, Emile. So upon these words, I will say a very big thank you to our two panelists and thank you to our audience and to all those who asked questions during the presentations. Of course, there were other questions that we could not uh, respond to at this time. But for those who can remain with us for another hour, we're just going to take a five minute break in order to fin officially finish the webinar and to say thank you to our panelists, although if they can remain with us, I think Dr. Kowali can stay with us. Emil is going to have to leave us. But uh, after this five minute break, we're going to have a discussion with uh, non attribution. So Chatham House rules, and we're going to continue discussing this topic. So please stay if you can you can raise your hand with the raise hand function in zoom and then we will um, keep you in the room for the open discussion so this will begin in five minutes in the meantime we will say a very big thank you to both our, our panelists thank you emil thank you dan